Does anyone remember the episode of the anime where there was a Farfetch'd in the forest and it was really good at stealing Pokemon? That was my introduction to Farfetch'd and being a young lad of high morals when I was just a young trainer, it made me really not like this little duck for a long time, but decades later, I can just respect the hustle now. Today we'll be taking a look at Farfetch'd in a Pokemon Red and Blue solo run. Now I had a user named Zaffy Reviews last year and every single week he would comment about one wanting to see a far-fetched run and sadly I have not seen him in a while so brother I think it's time for you to come back. Now as far as this little bird goes I would describe it as below average and at first glance it doesn't really look any good at all. Your best stat is 65 and let's be real with each other that's just not very good. On top of that Farfetch'd is one of the 57 Kanto Pokemon that have the normal and flying top. Normal's great we all know that but guys it's 2023 and I'm tired of pretending that the flying topping is anything but trash. It hasn't helped any Pokemon have a better run since I've been doing these runs for years at this point. And if you'd like to help the channel out, put both hands on your leak, slap that like button, and whether you are someone new, maybe someone who doesn't normally interact with videos, or if you're a returning subscriber like Pocket Medic, I'd like you to tell me what you think would be the best normal and flying top Pokemon when everything is said and done, when we're done with Generation 1. I personally thought it would be something like Dodrio, whenever we get to that run, but I have grown pretty fond of Farfetch'd here after spending some time with it. So with that out of the way, let's just sit back, relax, grab yourself a Sodi Pop, and let's just get into the run. Today you'll be watching an optimized run, so I will have to talk about the challenges that this run presented before we got here, and you might be surprised that it starts very early at the first rival battle. Something that can just catch you off guard about Farfetch'd is how squishy it is. It has very low HP, it has low defense, and and that means if the rival goes straight damage, you can actually lose this fight, and I did a couple of times. Now at the end of the day, this is a minor inconvenience, and since you start off with sand attack, you can just use that, and it basically alleviates the problem, it makes it much more consistent. Now looking ahead at Brock, we only have resisted moves, and I often talk about that push and pull, and the ebb and flow between consistency and having the fastest time, and Farfetch'd, potentially more than any run that I've ever done so far, really pushes that philosophy to its limit. Now for now, you might notice that I'm actually battling early encounters because when life gives you lemons, I like to make some lemonade and we'll come back to the significance of these small amounts of experience later. In red and blue in general compared to yellow, there's significantly less experience pre-Brock and being a wet piece of paper in terms of defense means that the optional rival and eventually the light years junior trainer down the road are just off the table today. You won't see any footage from them in this optimized run because they will completely dominate you if you try to fight them. Now, when you finish the three bug catchers that are left, you will roughly be about 40 experience away from level nine. And normally level nine's not that important because it's not a damage rounding number. But in this case, any extra HP or defense helps when you're trying to barely squeak through this challenge as fast as possible. Also, if you got that 40 experience and you hit level nine going into the Geodude, you would then be another 50 experience away from hitting level 10 when you beat the Geodude going into the Onyx. So that's why we battled about 90 experience worth of wild battles earlier leading up to here. And you might be wondering that if I had to skip trainers already, and I've mentioned multiple times how far-fetched is pretty paper thin in defense, that Brock would be a nightmare, and you're not wrong. Now, there was a point in test where I almost swapped to the yellow version, but I kept refining the strats in red and blue, and level 9 is ultimately where we ended up compromising to that point to where it's actually possible. So without further ado, let's take a look at the rock solid Pokemon trainer and we'll go over a few details. It's no secret that red and blue Brock is definitely harder than yellow version since he has extra levels and things like the defense curl on the Geodude just makes things a little bit more tough. The thing that makes Farfetch'd able to actually have a shot at progressing here are two moves. Now we briefly mentioned Sand Attack and it can provide some insurance so you don't get absolutely obliterated by tackles and at level 7 you learn Leer and you can lower its defense. Now this isn't a guaranteed fight, it's not an easy process at all at this low of a level. I'm going 
gonna zoom in here and I want you guys to really see how often that I would use Leer and the Geodude would immediately use Defense Curl. So it's going down, up, down, up, and it's just really annoying and it's very tedious and it happened a lot. Sometimes this would go on for like 10 straight turns and some of my practice runs. Now eventually with a slight bit of luck, Peck does start to hit hard enough with the lower defense that you can get past and now it's time for the fun part of the fight. Now with Onyx, there's some huge problems here. Now you can just use the six sand attacks immediately and you could mostly avoid pretty much everything it has, but there's two things at play here. The first is that we're actually outsped and the second thing is that Bide will bypass accuracy checks, meaning that we could dump an entire beach's worth of sand on this dude and it would still hit us. Now unfortunately, there's not much of a strategy here. You do set up sand attack so you can avoid its other moves, you use Leer to make it to where you can actually do some damage, and at a certain point, you pretty much gotta roll the dice and hope that you can avoid Bide. In this attempt, I do have roughly half of my HP left, so I can take a little bit of damage, and ultimately, I do go down to 3 health, but I get this one down on the first try, and honestly, this is the worst part of the run to really figure out. Now, I think if you would want this to be consistent, you'd probably want to be level 13 or even level 15, but obviously, that would cost you a lot of in-game time, and honestly, I have a lot of fun when I really push a Pokemon to its limits, especially when I massively over-level during the first test, and the process of kind of whittling down the time and whittling down the levels, that's probably the most fun part about making these videos, and there's probably something else I should say. Now, since getting to Brock only takes roughly four minutes of real life time, or even faster, I would just reset the entire run if I failed on Brock, and that's the main reason that the footage you see is looking so perfect. When I finally had everything routed out, this one took about five or so resets to finally get this footage here, get this run going, so it really wasn't too bad, but it's really not that great either, and it's just kind of worth saying so you guys kind of get a peek behind the scenes and know that every run isn't always silky smooth from start to finish. Now the Brock split was fairly specific and it was really refined so as we approach Mount Moon things are really no different. Now it's worth noting that the start of the game up to the second rival fight are where Farfetch'd by far is at its weakest state and there's still some extra things that I need to do rather than just mindlessly follow the standard path like a zombie. Here there are five or six extra battles I take on. We don't need to see every single one of them but there's things like three extra bug catchers, there's the double grass last, those are specifically weak to flying, there's a young there's a super nerd and when you get done with all of that you still need to battle one single Zubat that's at least level 7 or higher and that's gonna pay some dividends down the road and that's because when you finish the super nerd at the end of Mount Moon you'll precisely level up to 18 and when you do these videos a lot it's really easy just to gloss over terms or not talk about something in detail so something like damage rounding I feel like I'm gonna briefly talk about today because if you're new you might be confused about this basically Basically, levels that end in 0, 3, 5, or 8 get a pretty significant damage boost over other levels. Now this is for multiple reasons, and without being too wordy, the main thing is that your Pokemon's level is included in the formula for damage, and those previously mentioned levels always add more damage just because of how the math is set up. Now if you're a nerd like me, and you look at damage calculations, the difference in some of these ranges is staggering from one threshold to the next. Now you could have like a 20% chance to one shot something at level 47 and then you level up to 48 and all of a sudden it jumps up to like a 65 chance. It's pretty absurd but that's basically the gist of damage rounding and it's important because rival number two is not great today. And with all that said, you would think that level 18 would make this fight significantly easier because I've been talking about it and I'd be one shotting everything but no, Farfetch'd is pretty weak and Pidgeotto is pretty bulky. The fact of the matter is that damage rounding always helps but the main reason for hitting level 18 in this run is hitting 34 speed because that allows us to outspeed the Pidgeotto and kind of get ahead of the curve by sand attacking first because you know what they always say guys it's sand attack or be sand attacked this one is a little bit of a slog it's a little bit of a slow fight but it was really tough in practice so doing it this way being more reserved and cautious made this one more safe more consistent and if you get sand attacked it does make this one much more annoying but thankfully our sand attack did its job and all Ultimately, I start to mix in some leers with some damage, and we get past this one fairly clean. Now, as far as Nugget Bridge goes, you might be surprised when I tell you that Farfetch'd is not done with these weird breakpoints and kind of unorthodox
Doc strategies. When you beat the rocket at the very end that gives you the nugget, we just hit level 21, and here I use a very early rare candy to hit level 22. Now originally I was using two of these, and I was cutting out those optional Mount Moon battles, but as I tested more and more, saving that candy for later just provided more benefits. So what's the significance of being level 22? Nothing really. It was just the point to where I got the most bang for my buck in terms of experience, and later in the route, when you fight the last before Bill, it does allow me to hit level 23, and now the fun can begin, and this run all of a sudden gets a lot more interesting. Farfetch'd is one of three Pokemon that can learn Swords Dance naturally, and not only does it learn Swords Dance, it learns it significantly earlier than both Scyther and Pinsir. I don't need to tell you guys how much more powerful this move is going to make us, but I will say that from this point on, careful planning and routing, we can pretty much eliminate any extra battles outside of a few exceptions. Now we've seen in several moments so far in this video how frail Farfetch'd is, and what better way to show how much of a bump in power we just got by completely obliterating Misty. Now the strategy here is not that surprising. We set up all three Swords Dance on the much weaker Staryu, and then we use that extra attack to trivialize the Starmie. It works out perfectly, and from this point on, one of the bigger challenges in the run is now going to be to how to figure out how to not waste turns. Now on runs where you rely on badge boosting moves like this, it's very easy just to get it in your mind that you're just going to set up fully and just sweep every battle, but when you are pretty much competitively ranking Pokemon at their best on a personal tier list, learning all the fights that you could maybe get away with not using a Swords Dance or just using one or two can really shave off a lot of minutes at the end of the run at the end of the day. Now Swords Dance is just one piece to the puzzle here. And now we can just skip ahead all the way down to the SSN. Being a normal type and getting access to a stabbed body slam is really about to turn our life around. The unboosted damage potential this gives us is insane, and when you combine the ability to basically quadruple our attack, then you can start to see why Farfetch was a pretty intriguing run for me to kind of unlock its full potential. I had a lot of fun with this one. Now, outside of the 127 effective power of body slam, I do also pick up the rare candy behind the gentleman and now we can take a look at rival number three and there's not much to say here obviously i can easily one shot everything due to the information that i just talked about i don't even need swords to dance but instead i'm going to talk about comments for a second i'm going to get on a soapbox now there was one person that basically and this isn't the first time somebody said never skip a rival battle again brother i can skip this entire run if i wanted to i could have a four second video just showing far fetch blink on the screen and that'd be the entire video if i wanted to I think it's important for some of the entitled commenters to realize who calls the shots here and who controls this channel. And the moment that you start to sit back and just kind of enjoy the content without trying to tell me what to do, I think you'll have a better overall experience if you just let go of that mindset. There's a huge difference between constructive and helpful suggestions and just demanding things because you think you are somebody worth listening to. At the end of the day, what I'm trying to say is get over yourself. Take a step back, bud. Now with that out of the way, Surge is next. Next, and this is going to be reason number 43 why flying is bad. Now, thankfully, we are not in the slow leveling group today, and Voltorb is a god awful Pokemon, so I can just set up Swords Dance and I put myself in a position to one shot the rest of the team. Now, it's worth noting if you are at full health, you avoid the damage early in the fight, you can actually tank a Thunderbolt. Now, Surge is known for being bad mainly because people that you know do this for a living talk about Surge being awful all the time, but he actually has good AI in red and blue, and if you're weak to electric types, this one is not always easy, but I'm not going to stick up for Surge today, we can just keep moving on. As far as Rock Tunnel goes, it's really not that bad. The self-destruct hiker does require a full Swords Dance setup, and after that it's really not that bad, but it kind of sort of highlights the main limitations of Farfetch'd. We do not have, and we never will have, any coverage moves. We will never get a special move, and outside of weak flying types and the really powerful body slam, there's nothing going on here in this move set. Now battles where body slam is not going to be effective are probably the one thing that's ultimately going to hold us back and the main thing that's going to slow us down outside of that slow start at Brock. But thankfully moments like this, they aren't that plentiful in red and blue, but it's still a shortcoming nonetheless. Now from there we can skip ahead to 
Zeldon, and things are going to be a little bit more standard from here on out as I try to get to the end of the game as fast as I can. And as much as I would love to go ahead and go into Celadon Mart and buy to save even more time, the truth is we have extremely low base stats and we need all the extra vitamins we can get, so these next few segments will be about picking up all the money we can. Now I immediately hit up the rocket hideout and outside of the high money items, I do actually pick up a PP up here today for Body Slam because Farfetch'd is going to rely so heavily on this move that adding a few more uses to it really smooth out the run and as far as Giovanni goes, it's kind of just an easier version of the self-destruct hiker since not all of his Pokemon resist Body Slam. Now after that, I do pick up Fly and I'm just going to say it, I don't like Fly as a move. It's a two turn move, it has fairly subpar damage and on top of that, it doesn't have 100% accuracy and it misses entirely too much for my taste, but it is better than Peck, mainly due to the invulnerable turn, it's pretty good defensively speaking, and it just does more damage because of how the game rounds down that uneven 35 base damage of Peck when you're calculating stab and all that kind of stuff. Now after that, I can just roll rival number four. Now if someone still, if someone's thinking about putting a comment down why do I skip battles, just look at this. I go in at 19 HP, I take a hit, I'm very low, I set up one sword stance, and I just one shot everything despite being in the red help. It's really easy, and after that we can just really quickly finish up Pokemon Tower, I grab more high money items, and now we are continuing our way down to the Safari Zone. Here I actually grab the full restore with the intent to sell it, and I get things like the Carbus and the Protein for later, and after grabbing the final HMs of the run, there's still one more stop before we can spend all this cash money. And that leads us to Erica. We have the top advantage here, and after one setup we can sweep, it's really not worth talking about. Now it is worth noting while editing, I think that uh, maybe if I have set up one extra swords dance and then I just body slam sweeped, I could have an overall quicker battle and save a little bit of time, but I'm not going to redo the whole run just for that one little thing. Now the main thing that Erica does for us now is that we get the TM for Mega Drain to sail and we pick up two more battles and it allows us to actually squeak out an extra vitamin and believe it or not, it really helps out when you look at the totality of the run later. At the end of the day when we finally get to buy, I'm able to afford five proteins that pretty much maxes out all the vitamins for attack we can use and I do pick up three carbos that allows us to hit some speed related breakpoints at various spots in the run. At this point I've set myself up for success as much as I can and today we are going to head over to Sylph Co first because if a Pokemon can go to Sylph Co first and actually complete it, it is a decent time save. This is because in red and blue you're going to be using the Lapras for strength and surf and this kind of eliminates a little bit of backtracking in Fuchsia if you were to go to Koga first. Now outside of the rare candy on the 10th floor and picking up the optional protein on the 5th floor, we can just take a look at rival number 5 and kind of get an idea of how far-fetched we'll do in the late game. It is worth noting that I waited until just now to use every single one of my vitamins and that just allows me to save some menu time because I love optimizing the amount of time that I spend in the menus. Now Pidgeot is the lead here, and it's going to take a few turns regardless of what you do. I don't see a sand attack, and that's unfortunate, but I do want to set up two swords dance that's going to guarantee the one shot. And even though I take a good chunk of damage, I get through this one with plus four attack, and I'm looking like I'm in a good position. Now the plus four allows us to one shot everything, and I do outspeed the next couple of Pokemon, so it's not that big of a deal. Now this fight is not guaranteed, and we're going to see why. It's Alakazam. Guys, you better respect the Alakazam because if it wants to, just like in this footage, it will just crit with a side beam and end your life. And that's the very first reset of the run. And we can just jump ahead in the next attempt. Uh, it doesn't crit. The Charizard and both the Alakazam, they don't crit. Uh, Alakazam goes for confusion. Charizard goes for Ember. I survive. I'm set up. I'm boosted. I can one-shot them. So that's pretty much the fight. And it's a shame that we now have a blemish on our record, but it's still pretty impressive that with these low stats, I was able to come in here over-leveled and actually progress past the fight. Now we can just keep it moving along, we can skip past Giovanni, and now we can just take it all the way down to Koga, and this is worth noting that you can lose this fight, it's just out of sheer annoyance pretty much. If you get hit with smoke screen and then maybe go into some minimizers from the muck, it's not great, and if you're too worried about that, you can just set up a single swords dance, that guarantees the one shots on the coughing, but it's much more consistent if you set up two swords dance, that puts you in a better position to actually sweep through the fight much more easy, and I do think 
think that's what you should do here and that's what you've seen in the footage and with the low base speed the speed badge boost today is very helpful and just looking forward in general this is about as in-depth as fights are going to get it's always going to come down to setting up that sword stance sweeping so let's pick up the pace and start progressing to the end of this run next up we have sabrina and i actually outspeed the cadabra and i naturally can one shot it so there's no need to do anything extra just get rid of it avoid any shenanigans and when the mr mom comes in set up your one single sword stance and from there you can sweep it's not too bad the alakazam could cause trouble like we've seen earlier but here it just goes for recover and i'm able to take it out on the next turn despite under speeding it so it's not too bad and that immediately leads us to a very brisk swim down to cinnabar today there's nothing extra because we're already set up we're trying to make it to the end of the run as fast as we can we're trying to get the best time possible so after a little bit of tombstoner brother we can just take a look at Blaine. And this one's kind of similar to Koga. One sword stance is probably fine to make it through this fight, but here I do set up two. It gives you a little bit better damage ranges on the rapid dash overall. And the only thing worth noting, I guess, is that the Arcanine is incredibly thick. Even if you set up plus three sword stance, you probably wouldn't one shot this thing. So it's not great, but one sword stance, two sword stance to be safe. It's another badge down and we really, we only got one left. And my friends, we all know about yellow version Giovanni, and that's the main reason I didn't swap to yellow version today, because on paper, it looked like an absolute nightmare. And instead of just trash talking Giovanni like we normally do in red and blue version, instead, I'm just gonna give some constructive, I'm just gonna talk about it in a little bit more depth. For me, the main thing outside of the very good move pool that he has in yellow version, that's probably the main thing that makes it so good. But to me, one of the things that make red and blue version such a joke is starting with a Rhyhorn. It's just so weak and it allows you to fully set up and do whatever you want because it's so bad. And once you have this strong start and you can just do whatever you want to set up for the rest of the battle, things usually just fall like dominoes. With a plus six attack boost, I can pretty much slap everything down. And I think it's worth noting that plus four on your attack is good enough. But for the sake of the Rhydon, I do set up plus six because it makes it a little bit quicker. Now, I would like to talk about Rhydon real quick. I think it's a Pokemon worth respecting. If you have not seen my Rhydon solo run video, go watch that because it's actually a really good Pokemon. I know a lot of people just look at it and say, oh, it's double weak to grass, double weak to water. It's absolute trash, but it's actually a very tanky wall. It's a very good Pokemon and I will die on that hill. I think Rhydon is one of the most overlooked Pokemon of generation one. When the fight is over, I have all the badges. I use an elixir, I heal up, and I use a single rare candy for reasons that we'll talk about in just a second on rival number six. This this fight is very similar to rival number five and the fact that I want to get out of here with plus four attack so that I can one shot the Pidgeot. It's basically going to take uh, three turns no matter what and there's no threat of a sand attack so it's pretty safe here. I don't really take much damage at all. Now after that I do set up one more sword stance on the Rhyhorn and that's mainly for a badge boost. Now at this stage with plus six boost even on the Rhyhorn the resisted damage is doing a lot and with the extra speed I do outspeed everything else in the fight and I'm able to to mow things down now this is key the reason why i used a rare candy before is because you would level up going into the alakazam and if you give alakazam a chance to knock you out uh, a lot of times it's just going to take it so the rare candy allowed us to just get past the alakazam really quick now being in the fast leveling group oftentimes you just level up at bad times during fights and it's worth noting that i could probably use seven rare candies here i think eight up to eight i would still level up going into the charizard so there's really nothing you can do about it it's kind of a concession that you have to make and here it just goes for rage anyway so it really doesn't matter at all and i take the fight and it's not that bad and now my friends we are making our way towards the elite four and let's talk about the main reason why flying is utter trash and that is its weakness to ice now in generation one specifically you never think about ice damage but it's often something that creeps up on you at the end of the game if you're weak to it and you just don't realize how strong it's going to be so we have lorelei staring us down and there's not really much more to say about it other than that I do use six of my nine rare candies to go up to level 54 going into the fight and now I think we can just take a look at Lorelai and talk about it because this is a fun one
And one of the things that make me absolutely love Red and Blue is the jank. It makes it very fun. That's why I love making these videos. Now, Lorelai specifically, her Dugong's AI, loves to use Rest on turn two. Now, to set that up, you do need to use a Peck and damage it a little bit. Otherwise, the Rest is going to fail. And you can see from the footage that Farfetch does not appreciate Ice damage. But if you just trust in the process, do that Peck, it will Rest on turn two most of the time. And that gives you the perfect amount of turns to set up three Swords Dance and then go on the Sweep. Now, her Pokemon are really bulky and you really need that plus six on your attack or you just won't be able to make it past this fight. The only other thing to know is how we set up our speed with Carbos is that a plus three boost allow you to outspeed the Jinx as well and that's very solid. Overall, it's really not that bad. This fight right here is just like the epitome of why I love Generation 1 and the AI and how everything interacts and this is just a good showcase. This is a really good battle and I love that I was able to make it through this on the first try because if it wasn't for the AI I think Farfetch would probably have to be like level 65 or 70 to make it past this one. Next up is Bruno and I guess the only thing I can say is that his Onyxes actually do have rock moves so you know I guess that could hurt since we're flying typing so I do set up the full complement of Swords Dance just to do a little bit more damage and the other thing that that allows us to do is it kind of puts Peck in a range to where we can just one shot the other fighting types without having to use Fly so we do save a little bit of time but I don't know I'm, I'm at a loss of words for Bruno it is what it is we've already seen Bruno a ton so let's just keep it going Next up is Agatha, and you might be thinking, hey, I don't have an answer for Agatha, and you're absolutely correct, but we did have this planned out pretty well, on paper at least. So here, if you use one Swords Dance, you will outspeed this Gengar here, and he should be in a decent enough damage range to where most of the time you can one-shot it. Now, obviously here on the first attempt, everything's gonna go completely wrong. I get confused, I hurt myself multiple times, and then when I finally get the fly off with the Swords Dance set up, I just barely fail to knock it out, which is a very small percentage and it gets a super potion but even after that I'm still looking okay going towards the rest of the fight just to be extra safe I do set up one more time on the goal bat and at plus four attack I'm able to pretty easily progress to the fight and then I get to the Arbok and Arbok's normally never a problem but it's pretty tanky physically speaking I should have used body slam here I make a mistake I use fly it's much weaker I don't one shot it I get paralyzed and despite all of these problems guys I'm going into that final Gengar and I still have a shot and I'll just save you guys the trouble I get confused I hurt myself I get hit with the nightshade I get knocked out and I guess it's worth quickly noting that if you are confused and you hit yourself you basically hit yourself with a 40 base damage topless move that uses your attack stat against your defense and since we're boosted with the sword stance that's why it does so much damage to us but that's the second reset of the run and on the next attempt I make it through there's not much more to say in that it's Agatha it's just a roll of the dice I set up a swords dance at the start it misses hypnosis and I just kind of roll the dice once again just to make sure those damage ranges don't get out of control so I'm at plus four and I kind of just learn from my mistakes on the last fight I don't get paralyzed and I kind of just sweep through it's just like Agatha I'm not describing the footage here but you know sometimes on Agatha you'll hurt yourself eight times and you'll stay asleep for ten turns and then on the next attempt she'll just use dream eater over and over and allow you to do whatever you want and easily take the battle. It is what it is. Agatha's over with. She did take a reset from us and now we can take a look at Lance. And guys, I don't have a good answer for Gyarados. I haven't really mentioned it in the run, but today, how are we going to get past that? Let's take a look. I don't know if this is the best combination, but I get pretty lucky on the first attempt. You do need to pretty much be fully set up to sweep this fight. So what happens is I take a Dragon Rage, I set up. It goes for Hyper Beam and miraculously, I'm actually able to survive which is kind of surprising and since it has to recharge on the next turn I'm able to fully get my plus six attack and from there badge boost to speed all that kind of stuff even things like the aerodactyl that resist my body slam I can still one shot it so it goes without saying that nothing else stands a chance and we're able to take Lance just like that we really don't have to go into too much depth about it swords dance body slam you guys know the drill by now and after the fight is over, I do have more rare candies. I use them, I heal up. We have one last challenge of the game. I polish up my swords, I get ready. Now let's take a look at the champion fight.
Pidgeot is first, and this is kind of like a broken record. Now, I'm confident that I can tank this damage. Now, if it started mirror moving Swords Dance and then charging up Sky Attacks, I would pull the trigger early. But here, I don't take that much damage. I'm able to fully set up. I'm at 580 attack, and then we could just move on. Now, what's great about this, being able to set up early, those speed badge boosts that we got from Swords Dance allow us to outspeed Alakazam, and it's a non-issue today, which is fantastic. And I've said this before in an earlier fight, the medium fast leveling group, oftentimes you'll see it multiple times in multiple battles on the run, is that you'll level up at the end of a fight. And even though I'm able to pretty easily sweep through the rest of the team, I do hit level 72 just before I'm going into the Charizard. So what does that mean? It means that now we are outsped, and it means that the champion actually has a chance to take us out and force a reset. So what's it gonna do? That's right, folks. It's gonna critical hit on a Fire Blast and force our third reset. And I think out of all Pokemon, I've never seen one crit as much as Charizard does. This thing loves to crit. It's very annoying, but instead, let's just take a look at the next attempt. Things start the same way, but this time I actually take some damage. I take a sky attack, I take a wing attack, and I'm actually below half health, so I'm significantly lower, but I do get fully set up, and we've already seen from last time that I outspeed and I can one-shot everything up to the Charizard, so let's skip ahead to that. And what do you know, guys? This time, it's a complete 180. He misses the Fire Blast. I'm able to body slam him with our massively boosted attack, and that's the run. And that's it folks, Farfetch'd has done it. And I'm not gonna lie to you guys, this one really impressed me. For something with such low stats, that had such a bad start, like I had to, I had to really plan out how to start this run because it felt so bad when I first started routing it. And for it to eventually make it to what we see in today's video, it's really impressive. And this little duck has grown on me a lot. So at the end of the day, Farfetch finishes with a level of 62, only three resets and a final in-game time of 2 hours, 39 minutes, and 9 seconds. Now, if we were looking at the overall tier list, where would we rank Farfetch'd? Now, honestly, just like with Articuno, I think I have to say that Farfetch'd is better than Starmie. Starmie did finish 2 minutes higher at 37 minutes, but it had triple the resets, and I think if we did another Farfetch'd run, it's easily conceivable that we could have a resetless Farfetch'd run, considering that Agatha was one of my resets just through bad luck and the other two resets were straight up because I got crit. I think Farfetch was a fantastic run and unfortunately it's just outside the top 10 at number 11 but that's pretty solid considering that it's a single stage Pokemon with pretty subpar stats. Getting Swords Dance at level 23 and getting that Stab Body Slam really carry the run and this is one of my favorite runs I think I've ever done and I don't really have much more to say about it. I had fun with this one and if you've made it this far and you haven't yet consider subscribing and if you want to support the channel even more become a member today there's a few of you still left hanging on i appreciate you guys a lot so without further ado special shout out to tyler willis deal meves jwj mutus dozen d's master cheesy speakeasy josh ferment and kindle c the support you guys provide means a ton to me and that's about all i got for you guys so next week i think we're going to go back to an egg move run i'm a little bit skittish about going back to these because my last one I did was like June 2022 and it was my worst performing video for a long time and then a little bit ago I did the Magikarp video and it really bombed as well so I don't know what you guys want but I'm gonna do an executor egg move run next week regardless of what you think because it sounds fun that's all I got for you guys I'll catch you guys on the next one bye